For over a hundred years, local conservative constituency associations had virtual autonomy when it came to choosing their parliamentary candidate. This changed with the introduction of the party constitution in 1998. In that constitution, one of the issues that the MPs had demanded was the right to have their reselection determined by a show of hands at their constituency executive meeting with themselves present. The grassroots wanted a secret ballot. The issue came to a head in the Henley Conservative Association. In his speech to Friday's AGM of Henley Conservatives, the former Deputy Prime Minister made no mention of his future. But it's not just his views on Europe which are prompting some local members to ask whether it's time for Mr Heseltine to retire. In the past, it's been almost impossible for Conservatives to deselect their MP. But at this month's party forum in Reading, members from the Thames Valley successfully proposed that all MPs should have to face a secret ballot on whether they can stand again. For some, it's opened up the nightmare prospect of selection battles as bitter as those which disfigured the Labour Party in the early 1980s. Sally Graham reports from Henley. Henley in the springtime the very model of a model Tory constituency. With a majority of 17,000, sitting MP Michael Heseltine has little fear of losing the seat to the opposition. But in the game of politics, it's often the enemy within that delivers the hardest knock to ambition. He's done his 25 years. He's uh, now what they used to call an old age pensioner. He's had two heart attacks. It's time for honorable retirement. There is a 50-50 split. At the moment, it's been held very much under um, the pro-Michael side, but I feel that the other side hasn't been given voice. If there is a head of steam that will happen it's kept, and the lid is kept on, something has to come out somewhere. It should be debated thoroughly at, 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 a, at a local level. This year, Mr Heseltine celebrates his quarter century as Henley's MP, but he began his Commons career in 1966 in Tavistock. His rise to power in the Tory government came to a climax in 1990 when he dealt the fatal blow to Mrs Thatcher's premiership with his leadership challenge, only to lose the prize to John Major. Mr Heseltine has never been afraid of going against the flow of the Tory hierarchy. His pro-Europe stance has been a constant embarrassment to the party, leaving him badly adrift from Mr Haig's increasingly Eurosceptic line. But Mr Heseltine's supporters say he's always been a good constituency MP and will remain so until he chooses otherwise. I think he should stay on as long as he wants to. He's been an MP for us for 25 years now, done a great job and there's no reason for him to go. As far as I think, personally I'm concerned, well, do you think he looks like an old man? Whatever the strength of feeling against Mr Heseltine, the mechanisms of the Tory party mean there's no subtle way of deselecting a member. When it's time to re-adopt an MP, a general meeting of the association is held and an open vote conducted, forcing dissenters to stick their heads above the parapet. But moves to introduce a secret ballot could change that. I think the cases where you most find the, uh, the situation difficult is where an MP is getting very old, he doesn't want to give up, and nobody really wants to say to his face, well, look, it's time, old chap, for you to go. A lot of people in my fellow constituency are getting very, very angry about this and asking whether Michael should be deselected. Okay. But at a heated annual general meeting on Friday, one of the gatherings seized the chance to try and force Mr. Heseltine's hand. The BBC are here, yes, and they're BBC here, they are here in order, exactly, exactly, they're, they're here to get you to give them a story which will damage the Tory party. And if I may say so, if I may say so, you're doing a brilliant job for the BBC, you're doing a rotten job for the Tory party. Yeah. Mr. Heseltine, Bye, Michael. Mr. Hesel, may I just ask you, there is some opposition locally to you standing again, are you going to reconsider your position? Can you, would you mind telling me my wife comes to Mr. Heseltine had nothing further to say about his future plans, but if the opposition within his association grows, he may not be able to avoid the issue for much longer. 
Lord Strathclyde, welcome to Around Westminster. Uh, there's a logic, isn't there, if you're going to have a, a greater role for the membership that ultimately individual candidates as MPs should be accountable to them through secret ballot? Well, there is a process to be gone through. I mean, first of all, all MPs are democratically elected by their uh, constituents and, of course, so they're adopted by their constituency parties. Uh, but what the Conservative Party is going to do over the next few months is to have a, a consultation, a further consultation. There is an electoral college that will uh, eventually come to a conclusion. There will be a, a vote. And obviously, we are a considerably more democratic party than we ever have been in the past. But the thing about Michael Heseltine is this. Michael Heseltine has clearly served the interests of his constituents extremely well for a very long time. He's also served the interests of Parliament and he's served the nation. And uh, I suspect that his own constituents will want him to stay on. Because he could serve uh, the Parliament just as well by joining you in the Lords. He, he could. And uh, I very much hope that one day uh, he will. But of course, uh, the second chamber is in itself under threat from all kinds of potential uh, changes. And we don't know where that's going to end either. Your personal view, you stood as a Conservative candidate before you became a peer in your elections. Uh, do you think secret ballots are a good thing in principle? Well, in principle, uh, secret ballots are a good thing and we see them all, all over the place. But we don't necessarily see them everywhere. Now, in a political situation, what we have to do is to decide what it is that the party wants. There is a new constitution for the Conservative Party, which is far more open, far more democratic than it ever has been before. When we've, when we've gone through that process and had a, a vote at the end of it, then we'll be able to take a very clear decision. Is there not a danger, though, that in a, in a number of areas in the South East, we have MPs who have been in service for a very long time. It becomes a local issue. It becomes a source of resentment. In some ways, it becomes a problem in terms of recruiting new members. I mean, there are individual constituents we've reported on them before, where members have sat so long that they've almost become more abundant. In terms of attracting new and younger members, it's become something of a block. I don't think having a secret ballot necessarily solves that, solves that problem if it exists. Uh, the party decides who should represent them. The party locally decides who should represent them. That's a decision that they take themselves, whether it's by secret ballot or, or otherwise a decision that still needs to be... After the Henley debacle, the chairman of the Buckingham Association moved an amendment to the party's constitution so that a secret ballot would be held by an executive committee on the re-selection of the MP. The amendment was carried, although the chairman of Buckingham lost her position as chairman of Buckingham after a row over the issue with her MP John Burko. Michael Heseltine stood down at the 2001 general election. I'm supported by Margaret Thatcher, the former Prime Minister. And I'm supported by William Hague, the next Prime Minister. Hello, good afternoon. Napoleon said an army marches on its stomach. Six weeks on from Geoffrey Archer's call to arms at the party conference, the Tory army in London is on its knees. After Lord Archer's resignation as Conservative candidate for mayor, today's papers are full of the cries, we told you so. The Telegraph, for instance, has the very simple phrase, Geoffrey Archer, destroy. The Tory peer quits the race for mayor after admitting perjury, as it describes it. Shamed, says the Sunday Express. The Independent on Sunday, Archer quits in disgrace. And, of course, the News of the World, the newspaper that broke the story and caused the resignation, Archer quits as News of the World exposes false alibi. Well, Lord Archer stepped down after being alerted to that story planned for this morning's News of the World. Thirteen years ago, he asked a friend to lie for him to conceal the fact he was having dinner with a woman. It was one of the nights that the Daily Star had claimed he was sleeping with a prostitute, a claim Lord Archer successfully refuted in a libel action against the newspaper. Well, not surprisingly, the news of the world was selling well in the news agents this morning as London voters came to terms with the latest twist, six months away from the election for I men. think it's wonderful. He's got what he deserved at last. <laughs> They're all the same. It's just that he got caught. We're sorry because we really wanted him to be the uh, City of London and mayor. First, I feel he has the talent to do what needs to be done. I don't think he's governed by... I believe some in the Tory party did say they should really check very carefully and then I believe that wasn't done. But at least they haven't made themselves as ridiculous as Blair is doing with Livingston. More on that a little later, but the look for a credible way back for the Conservative Party in London begins this afternoon with a selection panel meeting at Central Office. Our reporter Joanne Coburn is there now. Jo? Well, it's all quiet here outside Central Office at the moment, apart from a few members of the press, but no doubt behind the scenes 
Tory party officials are frantically making arrangements for this afternoon's meeting on how to find a replacement for Geoffrey Archer. It's hard to believe that just a few months ago he was here, waiting for the announcement that he'd overwhelmingly been selected as the Tories' candidate for mayor, with the blessing of William Hague. I'm not an investigator. I say I've got a democratic party and the members choose. I have complete faith in his probity and integrity. William Haig may be regretting his unequivocal support for Lord Archer at last month's party conference. His dramatic fall from grace this weekend makes those remarks all the more embarrassing. Geoffrey Archer has let the party down and there can be no question of him continuing as our candidate for mayor. John Major and Lady Thatcher may also regret their support for the millionaire novelist. I thought it was a terrific speech. It rouses everyone's enthusiasm. Not for the first time, Geoffrey Archer's dream of holding future office has been shattered by ghosts from the past. I'm amazed that the Tory leadership have taken such an almost frivolous view about Geoffrey Archer's past. They've switched, I think, Mitkoff's on the outside and Archer on the... yes. Archer caused the break and it's Metcalf on the outside. Geoffrey Archer's always lived life in the fast track, but it hasn't exactly been a direct course to success. On the GLC in his 20s, an MP in his 30s, he was deputy chairman of the Tory party by the mid-80s, but was forced to resign after giving £2,000 to a prostitute. He won a libel action against the Daily Star, which accused him of sleeping with her. But he re-emerged in the 90s as John Major's unofficial cheerleader, and it was Mr Major who gave him a peerage in 1992. Two years later, yet again, his political rise was rudely interrupted. The Department of Trade and Industry has said that the senior Conservative Lord Archer is being investigated for alleged insider trading. He was cleared of the charges, but his reputation had been seriously damaged. By 1997, though, he was back on track with a vigorous campaign to become Mayor of London, determined to fight on despite questions about his past. And it's wonderful how Gillian Shepherd and Michael Howard and Brian Mawinney and Margaret Thatcher and John Major have all come out one by one on television saying we fully support Geoffrey and still you say someone out there is trying to stitch you up Geoffrey. The contest was dominated by Lord Archer and his bitter rival Stephen Norris but it was clear there was no love lost between the two men. Well I'll tell you something as I will never ever um, support Archer mm. alive or dead. For Geoffrey Archer 15,716, for Steve Norris, 6,350, and therefore I declare that Geoffrey Archer has been selected as the prospective Conservative candidate for Mayor of London. Thank you. Geoffrey Archer's standing amongst Tory members in London assured him the nomination, but almost immediately the party's worst fears about his credibility began to emerge. Could we have an opportunity to ask some questions of Lord Archer, please? Well, what are you frightened of, Lord Archer? Lord Archer. Why aren't you asking any, answering any questions? Could we, could we? What are you frightened of? But the damaging press coverage did nothing to diminish his moment of glory at the party conference. I think that it will be a lot of fun, whatever happens, and, um, and, I, and I think London is quite like this kind of diverse, very, very charismatic individual. I, 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 you know, I don't see any problems at him. Well, what do the Conservatives think about that prospect? Joining me, John Strafford of the Conservative Campaign for Party Democracy. He's also a party member from Beaconsfield in Buckinghamshire. And Ivan Masso, we saw a few moments ago in that report, head of the policy committee which will advise whoever turns out to be the Conservative candidate. And joining us from outside central office is George Jones, who's political editor for The Telegraph. George Jones, first of all, how much damage do you think this weekend's revelations will have done the party's prospects in this race? Well, they've done a lot of damage. I mean, they've thrown the uh, Conservative campaign for the mayoralty into chaos. Uh, they have also brought back into the spotlight all those allegations and damaging publicity about so-called sleaze, which did so much damage to the Tories before the last election. And they've also cast a big question mark over William Hague's judgment. I mean, the number of people coming out this morning and saying, I told you so, we warned you not to touch Geoffrey Archer with a barge pole. They're all saying they were proved right, and William Hague should have stopped Geoffrey Archer much earlier on in the campaign. Because we did here a, a few moments ago, in fact the interview I conducted with him at the party conference only last month where he said explicitly, I have complete faith in Geoffrey Archer's integrity and probity. Yes, and uh, I mean, I think William Hague did that without really the support and advice of many of his colleagues in central office. Many Tories still had serious doubts about Geoffrey Archer, but of course, the trouble was that William Hague was sort of caught up with the idea of trying to use Geoffrey Archer 
to embarrass the Labour Party because of Tony Blair's difficulties that stopped Ken Livingstone campaign and in a way they sort of used Archer for those purposes I think without really focusing on whether they got a candidate who could stand up to the inevitable scrutiny that was going to be placed on Geoffrey Archer's background as this campaign got underway. Ivan Masso, we heard your remarks there in that piece, you kind of regret your words in a sense as well. Well I don't regret them but um, Geoffrey's a, I mean he's a remarkable person when you meet him, he's, he's larger than life and um, I was, um, didn't know what to expect when I first met him but he's, you know, he wins you over and he promised that he was clean, you know, you've seen everything, I've made my mistakes, I'm the kind of lovable rogue and, um, and I'm going to do this job right now and we had to put it to the party, we couldn't just make a decision without um, without the backing of the party. I, 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 be, I think it would be a shame to have gone down the Labour Party's perceived route of, of just wiping people away. I think, it, I think we handled the situation as best as we could. Do you think next time then the party is there will have to be either Steve Norris is crowned after tonight's meeting or there's a new selection that the party needs to use the procedures it has, the Ethics and Integrity Committee, to actually check up on people before they're selected for what is going to be a, a hugely high profile uh, campaign. I'm not even sure whether the Ethics and Integrity Committee would have disqualified Jeffrey because the, these are things that just no one knew about and he'd been, he'd been open and honest it appeared about things that had gone wrong in the past um, and he'd proved himself in court and he'd you know, stood up against criticism and he'd come through and he was obviously a very very popular ca um, candidate. He won by a massive majority. It wasn't just a it wasn't just a, you know, a small margin. He really, really was, and uh, you know, popular. I don't know what we could have done. John Strafford, uh, you've been campaigning tirelessly for democracy in the Conservative Party. Uh, it has a habit of going wrong, doesn't it, when you leave it to the membership? Well, it has a ha habit of going wrong because we've forgotten our history. Uh, and the history of the Conservative Party was that after the 45 election, uh, 85 of Conservative MPs elected at that time were Oletonians and had bought seats in the party. Lord Walton changed that by bringing in a rule saying no candidate could spend more than £100. It was the biggest change, according to Lord Walton, that he made to the Conservative Party. And in this election, the uh, candidates were able to, to spend up to £80,000. We have reverted back over 50 years and become once again the party where the wealthy can stop buying so, positions. So in a sense you're suggesting that Archer actually barnstormed his victory in this ballot because he, he or his supporters spent so much money promoting him as well, the, the ideal Conservative candidate? Absolutely. I mean there's a report in today's paper where it says he's already spent all, uh, over a million pounds. Well, you know, you can't have candidates uh, that can spend that kind of money unless they're extremely wealthy. We've got to get back to our grassroots and we've got to start uh, having proper internal rules for uh, uh, the selection of candidates. The selection process itself was very democratic and it highlighted how undemocratic the Labour Party is. OK, George Jones, uh, do you think now that the party has to look at how it selects the replacement for Geoffrey Archer to find itself not repeating the same mistake twice? Well, certainly Tony Blair and other people in the Labour Party are making quite clear they think there should be a rerun election. I mean, that's partly because they want to distract attention from their own difficulties. I suppose one option would be that they could perhaps uh, nominate or put forward Steve Norris and then have some sort of validation ballot within the Conservative Party rather than going back to the whole selection procedure. But of course, there is also the argument that the fact that now Geoffrey Archer is out of the race and without the, as we've heard, the large amount of money that he could bring to bear on this campaign, it could open it up for people, businessmen or other figures like that, who'd be prepared to come forward. Okay, John Stafford, very briefly. Yes, well, I mean, they obviously didn't look closely enough at him. I mean, they, this Ethics and Integrity Committee is there not to come to legal judgments. It's there to look at the ethics and the integrity of candidates. They ought to have had Geoffrey Archer in. They ought to have interviewed him. They ought to have questioned him uh, and come to some uh, conclusions at the end of it. And what they should be doing if they're looking at Steve Norris or indeed any other candidates for this high-profile position, they should get them into, into central office, give them a, a real grilling and say, right, what are issues are there. We're not looking at your policies and politics and managerial capability, we're looking at ethics and integrity. Okay, John Strafford, Ivan Masso, thank you very much indeed. Some food for thought there for those who are at Conservative Central Office meeting this afternoon. Our reporter Joe Coburn is still there. Joe, what are we expecting later today? Well, at about five o'clock this afternoon, the 27 members of the London Regional Executive will gather here at Central Office 
for a meeting with Michael Ancrum, who will be chairing it. And they have two clear real choices, as we've heard. Either they automatically give Stephen Norris a walkover to become their candidate, he came second to Geoffrey Archer in the original ballot, or they hold a fresh election. Under the party's 1998 constitution, an Ethics and Integrity Committee was set up. It never met, even when Geoffrey Archer became the candidate for Mayor of London. Geoffrey was elected as the candidate after spending a huge sum of money on his campaign. Then he was forced to resign. They have withdrawn the whip from Geoffrey Archer and are calling him before their ethics committee. is like closing the stable door after a string of thoroughbred racehorses has bolted. The damage done to William Hague with yet another name added to the roll call of Tory sleaze, not to mention the money wasted in a dud contest for mayoral candidate, will shake the Tory faithful to its foundations. What does it say about William Hague's judgment that 18 months ago he was told there were serious problems with Geoffrey Archer's probity? Our political editor Mark Mardell has been watching this Rocky Horror Show. This latest chapter in the intriguing life of Geoffrey Archer won't stun the attentive reader. His life's been so colourful, so dramatic, that it's become commonplace to say he couldn't have written anything quite so bizarre in one of his own novels. But this twist is not really a shock. The plot so far was rich with clues pointing to a denouement exactly like this. I mean, Geoffrey Archer on the whole is perhaps one of the entertainments of our political um, scene. He's fun, he's amusing, he should never be anywhere near a political office. But as a novelist, um, and as a party giver, there's probably no, not much harm in him. But the idea that he should be a serious kind of political office, frankly, for a major political party, I think reflects very badly on that party. It's easy to see why the party's ground troops love him and his attacks on Labour. Mr Chairman, I will challenge them. And when it comes to May the 4th next year, with your help, I will beat them. It's less easy to see why at this year's party conference, William Hague not only greeted him warmly, but also went out of his way to say to an interviewer, this candidate is a candidate of probity and integrity. Today, he'd rather changed his tune. We were given false assurances uh, by Geoffrey Archer, uh, and as soon as we've had an allegation about him that has been substantiated and shown to be true, we've acted quickly and correctly. And I think we've acted in, in good faith and in accordance with natural justice throughout. Geoffrey Archer was clearly desperate to become mayor of this city, but few thought he'd make it to the end of the race. OK, hindsight is a wonderful thing, but it just happens to be a fact that most journalists and most politicians thought something would emerge to stop him. But why couldn't the Tories see this? A senior Conservative told me today, it boils down to a question of William Hague's judgment. But you've got to understand, William was in a very difficult position. But why was it a difficult position? Some senior Conservatives say if Mr Hague had blocked Lord Archer, it could have rebounded and led to a court battle. So he decided instead that the allegations were well known, so it was best to leave it up to party members. But why not call in the new Ethics Committee, which after all he set up and boasted about? I've set up a very powerful committee, an Ethics and Integrity Committee. That's part of the party reforms, because I'm determined that never again will the name of the Conservative Party be blackened by uh, one candidate uh, being uh, guilty of some gross misconduct. The three-person Ethics and Integrity Committee was set up with a remit to investigate allegations of conduct bringing or likely to bring the party into disrepute. It can also expeditiously investigate all matters put to it by the leader. It's meant to meet twice a year, although we're told it's never met. On the 5th of April last year, Lord Archer's biographer, Michael Crick, wrote Mr Hague a letter saying, in my view, Archer is a much sleazier character than Aitken or Hamilton or any of the other Tory miscreants of recent times, offering a private meeting to discuss this. More than a month later, Crick received a dismissive three-line letter saying, I acknowledge receipt of your letter and its contents have been noted. In June 1998, former Deputy Chief Whip Sir Timothy Kitson wrote urging that the Ethics Committee should investigate Lord Archer. Some Tories are not impressed all this has been ignored. The candidates on the shortlist should have all been given a grilling uh, by the Ethics and Integrity Committee uh, on ethics and integrity, not on their managerial uh, capabilities, not on their politics, but on ethics and integrity. This was a high-profile position, and we as a party couldn't afford to uh, get tripped up uh, in the way in which we have been. It's been run uh, like a, a cosy little club, a, a cosy little kind of 
uh, champagne and shepherd's pie type club uh, where you know if uh, you, you don't expect the club members to kind of lie to you well I'm afraid we're in a different era in politics now uh, and we've got to act in a very professional way this is not over yet. Lord Archer won a half a million pounds in damages when the Daily Star suggested he'd slept with a prostitute to whom he had paid £2,000 to leave the country. The journalist Adam Raphael gave evidence that Lord Archer had told him that he had met the woman, something Lord Archer denied in court. Mr Raphael says now he knows the full story and will publish it in this week's Economist, if the lawyers let him. He says William Hague has made a big mistake. Obviously he must have feared that uh, Lord Archer was a very popular figure in the party, had a lot of debts on which he could call, a lot of powerful friends, and he just funked it. Uh, it wasn't, of course, just uh, William Hague. A uh, lot of members of uh, Lady Thatcher's cabinet also came out, eight of them, in support of uh, Lord Archer, John Major, Margaret Thatcher, Cecil Parkinson, Michael Howard. They all ought to have known better. And if they didn't, they were just lazy because the facts were there. So who will be the new candidate? Former Cabinet Minister Virginia Bottomley has said today she cares deeply about London and has not ruled herself out. As de Boss and Deputy Conservative Chairman Archie Norman is flattered he's been mentioned and has not ruled himself out. MP John Wilkinson wants the contest open as wide as possible and has ruled himself in. While former Minister Steve Norris, who was second last time, is a bit disgruntled by the way the parties handle all this. Despite his own spot of bother with the tabloids over an active love life, he thinks the Ethics Committee shouldn't get bound up in philosophical debates about natural justice. I'd always assumed it was there not so much to act as a great court of law, but actually to act in terms of saying, look, are you an appropriate person or not? And sometimes, you know, in public life, it's not a question of anything more than saying, I don't like the smell. Maybe I can't find the dead rat, but the smell in here is awful. You know, that's what this process is all about. Lord Archer's wife and son went out and left him at home tonight. This is the most profound disgrace he's ever been in. He's been thrown out of the Conservative group in the Lords, and his lie has been referred to the Ethics Committee, which could now recommend expelling him from the party. It's hard to see how even the most resilient of politicians could bounce back. Mark Mardell, well now in discussion, first of all, Stephen Shakespeare joins us from Cambridge, who's uh, Geoffrey Archer's friend and advisor, and who's just in indeed come from his house. You said today that Geoffrey Archer was devastated. Um, presumably he's devastated at being found out, not devastated at any wrongdoing. Well, Geoffrey knows he's done wrong, and he feels extremely sorry. Uh, here's a man who's um, spent the day writing letters of apology. Uh, I mean, I have to say to you, he's about this big. Shouldn't have stood knowing all this, though, should he? Pardon? He shouldn't have stood for mere knowing all this. Well, I, I think this is something that happened 12, 13 years ago. Uh, he uh, uh, that doesn't excuse it, but uh, he obviously thought it was in the past. Um, he thought it was in the past, didn't he, when he saw William Hague uh, just last week? Because then... Is it true that he spent the first 20 minutes trying to convince William Hague that actually not to panic and, you know, he'd get over it and he would still make a good mayor? Uh, I wasn't part of that conversation, so I can't possibly tell you about that. Uh, all I know is that earlier that day we had been uh, outlining the various positions and, and, and Geoffrey was uh, quite clear that he, he would have to go. Uh, Max Hastings, editor of the Evening Standard, isn't the idea that William Hague could not have inquired thoroughly into Geoffrey Archer preposterous? I don't think one should look at this simply in terms of William Hague. It goes much further back. You've got to say that three successive conservative leaders have placed their faith in this man. John Major made him appear. John Major appeared happy to accept his hospitality, to give him hospitality, to have him in his entourage. Margaret Thatcher was happy to have him around. What we're looking at here is a man who, over a very long period, has been perceived by a lot of us as incapable of distinguishing truth from falsehood. Archer's difficulties with the truth go way back to his expenses as a GLC councillor, to innumerable business deals, to allegations of shoplifting in Canada. We've got a man with a record as long as you're on. And I personally have said to a long succession of Conservative ministers, how can you traffic with this man? And the answer is, I'm afraid, it's the old, old business. Politicians always need people to do party business for them, to go and speak in their and constituencies, to entertain you know, them lavishly, for, do all the rest of it. spoke for John Major in the 1992 campaign. Did you ever speak to, did you ever voice your uh, concerns to William Hague? No. Actually, uh, I, uh, I'm, that is not true. I voiced my concerns to William Hague about a month ago um, at a private meeting when we happened to be there at lunch, uh, and he replied, let the people decide. 
Uh, well, uh, Michael Craig, you went further than that because, uh, as we reported there, you wrote to William Hague and only received a terse reply from Sebastian Coe. Why did you feel it necessary to write to William Hague in such detail? Well, I mean, as a journalist, I think it, one should be very, very wary about interfering in the political process in that way. But I felt that there comes a point at which public duty demands it, that actually this man was not fit to hold public office. Um, and that's why I wrote the letter. I said it would do enormous damage to London and to his party, and that there were all sorts of new other stories that were bound to come out. And frankly, some of the things I know are worse than what has uh, come out this weekend. And do you expect to be able to um, substantiate these soon? Um, some of the stories, I, I think, will be substantiated very, very quickly. Others will, uh, much, will be much harder to substantiate. Well, well with us, uh, too, is Sean Woodward, who's um, the Shadow Minister for London, who wishes to have a separate interview in this discussion. But can I put, first of all, the points to you that um, uh, successive Tory leaders have been well aware of uh, Geoffrey Archer's shortcomings, uh, but have decided to turn a blind eye simply because he, he was a rabble-rouser, he had money, he dispensed largesse in the party, and frankly, you needed that. Well, I can see now with hindsight, it's very easy to describe it like that. Um, what I will say, no, you asked me a question, let me answer it. What I will say is the moment we had a specific allegation, which only actually came on Friday, uh, we investigated it, and by the end of that evening, William had dismissed Geoffrey Archer from being the Conservative candidate for mayor. You'd have been happy had this not come out, though, wouldn't you? We'd have been happy had the man uh, who actually came forward to the News of the World actually come forward to us in the summer of this year told us, I can promise you now, that had he done so, William Hay would have immediately insisted that we convene the Ethics Committee. And I can assure you now, Geoffrey Archer would never have been the Conservative candidate uh, for Mayor of London. But we've just heard that Michael Crick had the foresight to do what he thought was his public duty and right to uh, William Hague and got short shrift. This was, not, uh, this was not the sign that somebody was actually going to take any of these allegations seriously, even though you knew that uh, Michael Crick had had a substantial unauthorised biography of Geoffrey Archer published. Two crucial points here. The first relates to the issue about share dealings in Anglia, just as an example of this. Twice Geoffrey Archer was investigated about Anglia shares by the DTI. Twice they concluded that there was no evidence on which to base a prosecution. Insufficient. insufficient. Recently, the Labour Secretary of State for Trade announced there would be another investigation. Only on Friday of last week, he announced that having investigated it, there was no it, case, there was, it, no, excuse me, there was no case to answer. Now, the problem that we faced in the Conservative Party, and if Michael Crick had been able to come forward in June but, of this I, I year with this evidence... I don't want to revisit history at the moment, but the no. fact is that, you well, know, you we know he falsified his, qualification, me, his sorry, academic qualifications. You are revisiting history by asking me about leaders of the Conservative Party and their relationship with Geoffrey Archer, so let me explain. If Michael Crick had come forward with the material that the News of the World had this weekend, this summer and given it to William Haig. Again, I can tell you, we would have convened the Ethics Committee and Geoffrey Archer would never have stood as the candidate for Mayor of London. It's making, uh, this is all making a mockery, though, of uh, the Ethics and Integrity Committee, isn't no. it? No. William set up the Ethics Committee. And it's, would, when has it met? Uh, if you want to ask me the question, yeah. let me answer it. When has it met? If you, you ask me, it makes a mockery of the Ethics Committee, so let me answer that question. The Ethics Committee was set up to respond to specific allegations. That is in the constitution of the party. What we had finally on Friday was a specific allegation to which we responded. And within hours, William did what he said he would do with the party, which is that he would not stand for this kind of...